Hi, I'm Madda Spencer. Today we're going to go to Hudson Bay again, which is, I've never been there really, but it's one of my favorite places nowadays because I spend a lot of time thinking about how we can cool, cool the place. You know, my concern is that uh, the Arctic is warming about four times as fast as the rest of the world. And it's melting a lot of uh, CO, uh, releasing CO2 and methane. And uh, that just scares me more than almost anything else happening. So I'm trying to figure out ways of cooling the Arctic Ocean and the, uh, even the permafrost in the, in the Arctic. And uh, one place that we might start was with Hudson Bay because I live in Canada and Canada owns Hudson Bay. So we don't have to ask permission from anybody else if we experiment with things. So I've been talking to a lot of people about things that we could do to cool the Arctic and specifically starting with experimenting with Hudson Bay. So I have three people here who know a lot more about it than I do. And uh, we're gonna have a conversation about the various um, alternative ways in which we might be able to chill the place down a bit and maybe even refreeze the, uh, the Arctic uh, oceans uh, and, uh, and keep uh, Hudson Bay uh, frozen throughout the summers. So in uh, Edinburgh, Scotland, I think you are, that's where he lives, is yeah. uh, Stephen Salter, who is a, uh, an emeritus professor of engineering design at the University of Edinburgh. And he's somebody who spends a lot of time figuring out how to make nozzles on squirt guns. <laughs> Not quite, but he's uh, invented ways of making very fine um, uh, systems of, of uh, spray that will um, he can spray into clouds, which will uh, make the clouds a little lighter particles and larger particles are white and white clouds reflect the light back into space and cool the place underneath. In Ottawa is uh, my favorite climatologist, uh, Paul Beckwith, who is a physicist, an engineer and a climatologist, and he teaches off and on at the uh, University of Ottawa, but mostly he makes a lot of videos. And here in Toronto, um, but we're just getting acquainted, is Megan Sharamata, who is an environmental scientist at the University of Toronto. She's a PhD candidate, and she specializes in environmental change in the East Hudson Bay region. And uh, she actually goes and hangs out with, with people and knows what life is like for people living in, in the uh, coastal regions of uh, the Hudson Bay. And also here with me in Toronto is Adele Buckley, a very dear friend and a member of the, a very active uh, member of the Canadian Pugwash Group. Um, and uh, she is a physicist and engineer I wanted to uh, have today, if possible, uh, to think about alternative means of cooling Hudson Bay, besides the one that we've been in investigating most, which is to brighten the clouds. But um, the, some of the people that I wanted to ask about this, um, I haven't been able to reach and get them on, on board. The, the beauty of having Megan here is that uh, she can fill us in on what uh, the people are experiencing. Um, she is able to tell us uh, what the social situation is that is being experienced by people who are undergoing the worst effects the, of, of climate change. Um, so I'll get to you in a bit, though. Stephen, let me let me start with uh, let's let's give a real quick recap. Of, of what our uh, our original notion was that we were going to we we're going to specialize in talking about how we can cool Hudson Bay, possibly even refreeze the ice in the summer, or keep it frozen, and um, uh, by brightening the clouds. Uh, the physics began with some work by a chap called Sean Toomey, uh, and he was able to fly. Uh, over clouds and measure how much energy was coming from above, how much is being reflected back up and how big he could fly into them and he could measure the sizes and the numbers of the drops in them. And he did uh, a lot of work, which has been uh, 
pretty well accepted now and it's been replicated and it you know, everybody everybody believes it and it boils down to the fact that if you have a lot of small drops in a cloud you get a high reflection and if you have the same amount of liquid water in a in a smaller number of bigger drops then it's a darker cloud mm -hmm. and what we have to do is to increase the number of, of, of drops in the cloud for the same amount of water and you need to understand that to make a cloud drop, uh, you can't just have the relative humidity going up to 100%. You also need a little seed. They call it a condensation nucleus to get the, the drop started. And once it's grown over a certain size, then it can keep on growing. Uh, and this depends on some work to, by a chap called Kohler. And we know the sizes of the drops you need for different kinds of relative humidity and different kinds of chemicals. And the really important thing to realize is that the amount of energy you need to make a condensation drop from seawater uh, that's going to be the right size is very, very much smaller than the amount of energy that will be reflected by the cloud drop that grows on that seed. And it's many millions of times so we have a way of spending a very small amount of energy in an intelligent way that will make us able to reflect a uh, a much larger amount of energy. I mean, it's it's uh, ten to the something. Ooh, I can't remember. It's but it's it's so big that it really is a wonderful a wonderful tool. And uh, the way to do this is to uh, filter seawater and then squirt out tiny tiny drops. Uh, below a micron in size, and th they are mixed up into the bottom of the atmosphere because it's turbulent. There's a boundary layer, which is a bit like uh, stirring cream into your coffee, and that gets the little drops uh, uh, creating bigger uh, uh, cloud drops. Mm -hmm. And uh, the cost of it uh, seems to be really very, very affordable, maybe even cheaper than having COP conferences. <laughs> so that's that's uh, marine cloud brightening, and it, the names are uh, Sean Toomey and John Latham, who mm -hmm. uh, thought of the, the the idea of applying Toomey's work. Uh, I'm just trying to do the engineering, and I'm delighted to say that we have uh, somebody who's joined us since I introduced everybody else. It's Lawrence Martin. Uh, uh, Lawrence is a Canadian musician and politician of Cree heritage, and he has been the Previously, the Grand Chief of the Moshke Gowak Council. Is that how to pronounce it, Lawrence? Very close. Very close. Moshke Gowak. <laughs> Moshke Gowak. Okay. There you go. That's good. But now you're doing, uh, you're the chair of a, a uh, marine uh, conservation area um, that is administered by, uh, is it the Moshke uh people, uh, a council? Uh, is that right? I haven't quite got it, your your title down, but I know that you're actually doing hands-on administration of trying to save the environment. Is that right? Yeah, that is correct. The, the title that I have is the, the manager of the National Marine Conservation Area Feasibility Study of James Bay and Hudson Bay. So we're doing that now as we speak, and we're into now going into our second year, getting everything all organized. And certainly uh, taking a look at all the various studies that have taken place in the past, including some of that kelp we talked about the last time. Mm -hmm. And now we're finding out a lot more. We just saw a film by National Geographic people that were in Hudson Bay this summer of what they were able to find at the bottom of Hudson Bay in various places that they dove into. So that's going to be released this coming year, and we're looking forward to that. And so we're going to continue uh, with the studies, and certainly uh, what we're talking about here is is of great interest. So I think uh, certainly my staff, my work, my colleagues here at Muskego Council, I told them about our last conversation we had, and they were quite interested to learn about, you know, the uh, the mist that the gentleman was just talking about now that can be created over the Hudson Bay. Mm -hmm. or any any ideas of how to be able to prolong our lives here on earth as human beings i suppose you can say well so, i'd yeah. like to hear more about that because i know that we you know uh, it's it's not like we're going to bound ahead doing things on our own when 
you are the folks living there, you know, you're the people who have to uh, live with what the, the consequences would be. Have you met Megan Sharamata by any chance? Megan, do you know Lawrence? Well, Jay Lawrence, we've, Hi. we've never met, but uh, it's great to meet you. Oh, you too, likewise. Yeah, Megan is a, a, an environmental scientist at the University of Toronto who spends uh, most of her time on the east uh, with the people on the east shore of Hudson Bay. Okay. And, uh, Hudson Bay is such a, a, an enormous body of water that the people who live on the east shore are, you know, a thousand miles away from practically from the people on the other shore. So mm -hmm. uh, you may not even know each other that way. Okay, I want to I want to bring both of you in, and and mostly here's this: um, we don't know what realistically what can be done to chill the water, but it's just so important to chill the the entire uh, Arctic, and and uh, there are things that we know could work. Uh, the question is, would they have side effects that we wouldn't like? And not only that, but would be, people want it to happen? Suppose we could refreeze the Hudson Bay so that it, it's frozen, you know, at least partly uh, frozen in the summers. Would this be of value and um, would people want it to happen? And what, what, would, what would be the social impact of, of doing that? Before that, why don't we get um, Megan and Lawrence to tell us what's happening with the ice on a yearly basis in Hudson's Bay right now where they are and um, what how that's different from say 10 or 20 years ago like where, where are we at right now good point but, uh, I've been working with the elders a lot since we started this project and me growing up in this area also I've heard stories over time about what the changes that are going on in this area so, and particularly to the ice in Hudson Bay, I know this summer, for instance, I mentioned National Geographic people, they were out there in their ship, the 64 foot ship, and they were having a hard time getting around because of the ice. Ice is moving around chill out there. Now it's in July, the, near the end of July. So there's still a lot of ice, but at the same time, what we see as people on the shoreline is that there's probably less ice because now we have a lot of polar bears that are moving inland into the shores, into the bush, like even 150 miles inland from uh, from the shoreline. And they're going after beavers, you know, for food and that sort of thing. So we know there's changes happening because of the animals and how they're moving. We also see a lot more polar, bear, polar bears moving into the James Bay area into the Agamaski Island area. So they say that our counts are actually uh, increasing on the number of polar bears that are entering James Bay. So we feel, and what the elders have been saying, is because of the lack of ice for them to be able to continue hunting out in Hudson Bay, why, why, that's, why that's going on. So obviously there's the climate change, the warming of, of, the, uh, of the earth that's going on and, and it's affecting the animals and therefore they're moving. So that's how we read what's going on on the ice in the Hudson Bay. And in the James Bay's ice is the same thing. Uh, we had another ship that was out there called William Kennedy this year. And again, same thing. They were having trouble getting around because of ice that was now floating around. And smaller chunks, mind you, but still floating on the currents that are being blown in from the, from the north, from the Hudson Bay area. So there's activity there. And uh, when we fly along the coastline, uh, we see the, the animals that are out there, seals and so forth, out sunbathing early in early March. You know, some, now we're getting to be sometimes the odd February ones that are out there. So there's a change of ice that's, that's going on all together. Uh, you see, these are, uh, these are uh, seals or something that normally would be when, and you're seeing them. Later in the springtime, later in the spring, like in April, they would be out sunbathing. You know, we call it sunbathing on the ice. I see. And, but now they're coming out earlier. So that means so, it's warmer. and it's, that's, it's a lot warmer, yes, for sure. Are they as healthy or do you know whether it's affecting them? Um, which would they rather <laughs> have? Well, they it's, have? It's, uh, well, I know from the, the polar bears, I mean, the polar bears depend on the seals for food. And so when there's a lot of polar bears coming inshore onto the shorelines, 
that means they're not able to access the seals as much because there's no ice for them to be able to do their hunting on 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 that. So there's there's an impact there's there's a impact that's going on. So maybe it's the uh, the thawing of the ice that's affecting the the polar bear from getting onto the ice, and therefore the seals are now much more in abundance because there's less polar bears being able to hunt them out there. So we see that correlation of activity going on. And also in the southern part of James Bay, we see now polar bears coming right into the communities at Moose Factory, which is way south. So that's a new phenomenon that's, that's going on. So there, obviously there's lots of changes happening. And uh, people keep telling us that, yes, it is, that there's the permafrost that's also melting on the river systems. So that's affecting how the rivers flow in the summer and uh, especially in the springtime. So we see that going on. And how does it correlate with the, with the scientific findings? We haven't really tested those out specifically to try and match the, the science studies mm -hmm. versus what our elders are telling us. Mm -hmm. I'm just telling you what I've heard the elders say. It, if, if possible, you would like to have it colder. Well, I guess that's something that would have to be talked about uh, in general. We're going to be going into the communities this uh, in March, starting in March, and having these three-day events in every community. So we'll be talking about a lot of these scientific studies that have been uh, taking place and also asking the, the elders and the community members themselves about these types of questions. You know, what can be done about the climate change? They don't really say what can be done. They only see... And what they see going on is what they share and what, and what is about to happen. Not so much of what can happen by trying to make any changes by, by the human race. A few decades ago, was there um, lots of open water um, on, on the, on the, in the area you're at um, in summers, at the, by the end of the summer? Or was oh, there... yeah, definitely. Definitely when we're flying out over James Bay, you can see that. Some ice was out there, and uh, but the further north you go, there's, there's, of course, there's more ice that can be seen. And right now, uh, even in the summertime, when we go, say, in August, you see a lot of ice that are now being blown into the shore. So there's ice at the ice. It's not as solid, it seems. It's mm -hmm. it's breaking up, and it's being able to be blown be, be blown into, into the shorelines a lot more, which makes it harder for the people that are out hunting to get out, you know, to try and squeeze out of that the estuaries that they uh, live near. But tell us how this is affecting the people, uh, how, how they did things, I don't know, 30 years ago and how they do it now. Mm -hmm. A lot of the, the hunters, when they were out there, they, they witnessed those changes and therefore it affects how they hunt and where they actually would go. Mind you, in areas to the south, there's more access because there's less ice. So they're having a different impact on the hunters and access to more food, more geese, more, more of everything that they, they get. But to the northern folks, it, it seems to be the other way around because of the ice, the way it's moving around, it's blocking certain passageways that they normally would be using. So that has an impact on what they're able to use for food. So it depends where you are exactly and then and, and, and how the, uh, the weather patterns uh, change over from the Hudson Bay to the James Bay is quite a distance and there's quite a bit of difference. We're uh -huh. on the west side. Uh -huh. Well, Mary, yeah. uh, Megan is, uh, specializes in the east side. So That's right. let's have a, a comparison of notes there. Tell us about the life on, on the east shore of Hudson Bay. Um, well, like Lawrence has just said, I can only tell you what elders and younger hunters from, uh, the Belcher Islands, which are off the coast of Eastern Hudson Bay, the community of San Kilowak, and the community of Kujarapik and Umuyak and Inukjuak. So they're all the communities in that really semicircular curve that, that we all kind of recognize from our high school maps all along the coast there. And they asked me to work with them to document changes that they've seen in the sea ice environment. So the ice itself, uh, the surface waters and wildlife. And uh, going back to the 1970s. And um, so this Inuit, these are Inuit communities and Inuit are sea ice users. 
um, and have historically used ice going quite far down the, um, it's like Eastern James Bay. So along the coast of Iwishi, which are the homelands of Cree uh, on the other side from Meshkegawak territory. So I haven't worked that far south, but um, sharing some of the results of our work, which Inuit and Cree have started to do within their own knowledge sharing uh, uh, conference um, within the Hudson Bay Consortium over the last few years has really allowed people to exchange ideas about their concerns about all these changes and about uh, sea ice loss and about their priorities. And, you know, when we talk about like the big decisions like that, the first thing that is always coming to my mind is Indigenous self-determination, that we're talking about their homelands, even though it's, as you said at the beginning, it's all within Canada, um, these are Inuit and Cree homelands, first and foremost. So whatever happens there, really, they are the decision, they should be the decision makers of what happens on their lands. And anyway, so just going back to the 1970s, the reason why 19, 1970s was of interest was because that was when the, the James Bay Project um, was initiative, construction was complete by the early 1980s. And that's when environmental change really began for Inuit and of course the Cree who were affected by the, the flooding of the building of the infrastructure of those dams. But important to note, and I'm someone who grew up in Montreal uh, and I grew up on James Bay electricity essentially. Uh, we heat our homes with electricity and uh, so uh, we use most of our electricity in the winter months and what the James Bay Project did was it flipped what, you know, freshening of the marine waters used to happen in spring with snow and ice melt. And spring extends all the way to June, maybe even early July in Eastern Hudson Bay. Um, and now we see peak freshening in December, January, and February. And for those of you who are climatologists, any sea ice climatologists know that this really affects ice atmosphere interactions and really drove sea ice loss from the results of our work together um, until the mid nineties. And uh, there was effectively the loss of what was once a very thick, stable sea ice platform as thick and as productive in terms of providing for wildlife habitat for hunters as ice very far up in Nunavut um, and that uh, the loss of safe, navigable sea ice was immediately perceived. And so there's been a lot of team-based work uh, really led by Inuit and Cree now. They're looking at sea ice changes more closer inland. Um, I don't know if Lawrence agrees with this, but, you know, the elders that I spoke with always referred to Cree further south as people who lived in the trees who didn't use the sea ice as much. So, um, and Inuit used to go down to Agamaski. Actually, I think Agamaski is technically in Nunavut, although when I was in Meshkegawak territory do, doing some work a few years ago, uh, Cree, it's an island that Cree and Inuit have used since time immemorial, as far as I know. Maybe Lawrence could. Tell me something about that. I should put in a map. Uh, maybe I can find one later and, and uh, superimpose it over somebody's face here, but I, I, I can't visualize it in my head. Uh, but uh, maybe we can <laughs> find a map later because you're talking about something that we should be looking at. Okay, thank you. I've been um, looking at my map behind me the whole Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So Lawrence, um, I don't know if if you can answer this, but I I many elders who've passed in the last few years. There were a couple from Chisasabi who lived in Chisasabi who used to do a lot of sea ice hunting in James Bay, and there were a lot of Inuit 
maybe living in what now are called Cree communities, but, you know, there are a lot of Inuit and Cree on the land in northern James Bay, and that the loss of sea ice has had a, in the 80s, had a big effect on Inuit ability to go down into James Bay. Yeah, a lot of our stories of the Inuit uh, stems back maybe, say, 150 years ago, when there was a lot more interaction going on amongst people of, of all the Hudson Bay, James Bay areas. And uh, so uh, the Inuit have not been in our area since since then. Uh, I know Agamaski Island that you talked about, it's, uh, again, the stories are the same. The Inuit haven't been there for a long time. And there's a lot of different changes that have happened too. That We used to have a lot of walruses on Agamaski Island. They no longer exist there. They now have moved further up into the Hudson Bay where uh, Hudson Bay James Bay meet on Cape Henrietta, we call it, on the west side. So that's where the walruses are stationed today. So that's a big change. And we even have names of uh, places referring to the walruses further into the James Bay, down into the James Bay, but they, don't, they no longer live in that area. So those, those are some of the changes that have happened. And uh, yeah, none of it is, uh, I guess, has Agamaski Islands and all of the islands in James Bay as far as when they, when they were created by Canada so that automatically came with that that possession that they could have but as part of our uh, discussions here we're having with none of it on the islands like Agamsky there's a willingness to you know talk about that and to refer it back to us to the Meshkegwag people for them to manage it because there's a lot of bird sanctuaries there this is a flyway for all the migratory birds from the south, from Central America, South America, and so forth, shoreline birds, geese, you name it. So this is where they come. So we're obviously re really wanting to work together with all people, not just in James Bay, but to the south of us as well, because that's where the birds come from, like from Mississippi and from, you know, um, Florida area, everywhere. So we need to work together with them to make sure the birds are going to continue flying, be safe and have food to eat. So our, we're mindful of that and, and definitely uh, mindful of how can we work together with the Inuit even more now, how much more can we protect all of Hudson Bay in this conservation effort that we're putting together, not just James Bay, because with James Bay, it's easier because it's just basically two groups of people, the Crees on the east side and the Crees on the west side. And, but to the north, you know, the bay is bigger and uh, we need to work together with the Inuit and with uh, the people to, uh, in the Manitoba area, Northwest Territories. So there, there's a desire to do that. It's just a question of time and, and how to do it. So and I think do, by... Me, do you think that there's any incongruity or differences of the interests? So far as you know, do any of these people have... And, and, uh, are they advantaged by something that would be disadvantaged dis and a, a disadvantage for one of the other groups? Are their interests are aligned or are there some incompatibilities of interests as far as you know? No, everybody is, you know, understanding of the environment and how we're all part of that life cycle the humans and the animals and the birds and everything that we depend on, the food chain, we're all part of that. It's just a matter of where we live and how we get the food. So working now, together. Now if, if, for example, if we could, if it if it becomes possible and and feasible to uh, to uh, keep the the parts of the uh, of the Hudson Bay frozen throughout the summer, are there some people that you know who would find that a a problem that they wouldn't want that? Um, it's, it's possible. It's possible. <laughs> yeah. we, we haven't asked that question, but you know, if you put it that way, if people had a choice, maybe they'll have something to talk about right now. I don't think we have a choice to say yes or no, we would keep it frozen or not. We're just watching it melt away at this point and making plans and probably having to relocate our communities because of that and the impacts of that. Yeah, well, we're we're thinking we're thinking of you know fanciful uh, ideas that may not be realistic, or may there may be some side effects. 
uh, 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 Megan, if you if you know of any um, income. Uh, in well, I, I think what Meta is uh, getting at is, you know, uh, and let, can, I, let, can I just say a couple words on my thoughts? Of um, you know, indigenous self-determination, of course, is very important, but it's becoming so that all of none of humanity has any self-determination on the climate. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, the, we, we, the, we, we put so many fossil fuels, we burn so many, we put we've changed the atmosphere, the chemistry of the atmosphere and oceans are we're suffering consequences of massive climate change. I mean, you're getting a lot more um, storms, I think, you know, massive storms and, and I call it weather whiplashing where it goes from say, for example, in Ottawa, you know, a week ago it was minus 31 with a wind chill of minus 40 for several days. And now it's like five to 10 degrees Celsius. Okay. Um, and it could swing back if another polar vortex came along. So, so the idea of weather whiplashing from one extreme to the other, I think that's very hard on, on any, on, on all ecosystems. So I guess, um, you know, people in the North are, are seeing the, the warming much more acutely than people in the South. Meta at the beginning mentioned that the Arctic's warming four times faster. Well, for the longest time, scientists were saying double twice as fast and, and now then it became three times as fast and Meta said four times. I mean, for years I've been saying it's five to seven times faster. It depends on the um, latitude that you're at. You know, the higher the latitude you're at, the faster the warming. And this is because the Arctic's becoming a much darker place. It's, a, it's losing snow and ice. It's absorbing more sunlight. You know, the, the Arctic amplification effect is, is ever increasing. So, so, People up until now, people really haven't been thinking much about, you know, can we do anything to reverse this? Can humans do something? But now the problems are becoming so severe that it's really in the works that um, we may actually have to try to cool the Arctic because a release of methane and CO2 and melting of the permafrost could shoot the earth into a much totally different regime. Um, which will be taken out of human hands when the methane and CO2 are coming out of the earth and they're dwarfing human emissions from fossil fuels. So, so it's a very nonlinear uh, system and nonlinear process. So what the purpose of, of this meeting really is we need to start getting, giving people the idea that it, is, it may be possible for, for us to do things to reverse this, this huge warming in the Arctic. And mm -hmm. so one of the ideas is that Canada could be the first place where this is done in the world in the James Bay, Hudson's Bay region, because it's all within Canada. We don't have to deal with the international community getting buy on from all of these different groups. So how would we cool this area? And there's a, there's a number of different ideas. OK, Stephen Salter's work is on brightening the clouds. So that the brighter clouds, and these are low level to mid level clouds, basically, so that the clouds are brighter and they reflect away more sunlight. So it's cooler underneath the clouds. So basically cooling the regions or the entire region of James Bay, Hudson's Bay, you know, whether if it was done in the summer, I mean, the idea is to keep the ice around much longer. So um, if you thicken the ice, and stop it from disappearing in the summer, you've got a bigger head start on ice regrowth in the winter. And if you manage to keep it around in the summer, then over time it can thicken because it never completely disappears. Um, so that's what, so there's different ways we can look at doing that. One of them is marine cloud brightening, but, but um, you know, Meta has concerns because it only works over wa open water. If you brighten the clouds over an ice surface, the ice is already highly reflective of the sunlight. So your bright clouds above the ice surface won't have as much impact on, on causing additional cooling. So you wanna do that over, over open water, which is dark, right? Very dark, you're replacing, so the sun coming down, instead of hitting the dark ocean and being absorbed and heating the water, it hits the bright clouds above, reflects and lets ice regrow over the wa dark water. Um, the other idea, another idea is to go higher up. There's clouds behave differently on whether they cool and heat the earth depending on their altitude. Okay, so low level clouds generally are 
good for cooling the surface underneath the clouds. Okay, so that's the idea of the marine cloud brightening. But high level clouds, I'm talking about the thin wispy cirrus clouds, they, they, are, um, they keep the heat in. You know, if you're in the desert and it's a cloudless uh, sky, the swings of temperature can, can be enormous from day to night because at night, all of the heat can radiate out to space. If you have high clouds, they, they reflect some of the radiated heat back to the surface and they actually keep it warmer on the surface. So, you know, we have a minus 30 day, it's going to be a clearless, cloudless night because the heat can radiate out to space. So one of the ideas to cool the whole region is to thin the high level cirrus clouds. And if you reduce the number of high level cirrus clouds then more heat can radiate out to space and you can cool the whole region. Okay, so these are the, these are the two main uh, ideas that we're thinking of. And the idea of doing it over Hudson's James Bay is that it can, all, it can be a within Canada thing. You know, we don't need international buy-in to do this. So, so that's the, the, the main thing. So I guess what Meta is trying to do for, is, is get more, we're trying to get more information from people that live in the region that see what happens year to year with the ice and whether we, could, whether we would get buy-in to try techniques to cool the whole region and get back to thicker ice. Now, I assume there's less interaction between people living in the area now because they can't travel from one area to the other area across the ice like they used to, right? I think that's my, um, I, don't, I could be I wrong on that. I wouldn't assume that at all. There's a okay. lot of long-term relationships and we're talking about many different regions in this area and I mean, I'm just not to but, cut you off but I do think that it is a multi-jurisdictional area where people have rights and who've experienced really negative effects from major development projects that transformed the environment in the pretty recent past in ways that had very negative impacts not just on hunting, on people's ability to feed their children where they were feeding their children. You know, like there's a legacy right, of people right. from the okay. outside. Can, um, can you just let me? Yeah. When, yeah, when I say that, yeah. starting yeah. from the indigenous self-determination, like it, it really is important because there's a lot to learn from their experiences of environmental change that are irrelevant. And I'm not saying that people might not want want to entertain this idea, but I do think that uh, there's a, a lot of work to understand sea ice and salinity change. And there might be other ideas if you build relationships with this big network of Inuit and Cree and researchers who are supporting them uh, to see what the reception would be. Like I would say, go there and ask people. Yeah, yeah. The, my comment on self-determination is that, that none of humanity has self-determination. You know, under We're talking under about abrupt, within under, land use decision making within Canada, like I'm, it's I'm just, just the basis of our. Change. You know, the, the climate is we set the climate change in motion, and uh, there's nothing that an individual or a group of small group of people can do. I mean, they can only um, they can only adapt to the changes, um, and governments are not trying to stop the problem because uh, fossil fuel companies are still making record profits and. And, you know, as much as renewable energy is growing, the fossil fuel chunk is still there and the lobbies are strong. And, you know, our planet is changing. I mean, our climate is changing. Our weather is changing. So we only so we have self-determination within that scenario. But we have we don't really have individual um, ability to change it. So the, the, the thing is, is the Arctic, the, the Arctic, James Bay and Hudson's Bay, like all the Arctic is warming at incredible rates. There's less and less sea ice. Uh, the sea ice is thinner, so it's more mobile. It moves from one location to another location. Um, but those are, those are um, transition effects, okay? In a few years, there'll be no sea ice at all for people to worry about, okay? It'll be completely gone. Uh, even if we had a methodology to fix what's wrong now and make the ice return, uh, it wouldn't be uh, permanent in any way because it's getting warmer and warmer. 
and the way things are going, it'll keep on getting warmer. So what will work now to make the ice come back will 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 stop working, you know, before too long at all. So it doesn't seem, you know, really worthwhile to to do that. I, I wonder about the local people. Um, uh, they're continuing to adapt. They're famous for adaptation of to circumstances, and I think uh, best to assist them to adapt rather than try to return the ice. And then, it, even if we spent a lot of money on it, it, it would stop um, uh, 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 being useful as when the climate continues to warm. Well, look, I mean, everybody here is right in some way. Uh, for sure, Megan is right. We, we do not if, if act as if we can go in and do things that, uh, as if we run, run everything. No, and, and we wouldn't. And that's why we're asking Megan and Lawrence, and, and, and we will be inviting other, other people because we want to consult as we go along and get feedback. Uh, and and uh, of course, Paul is right. Nobody has control over the world's climate today, and that's the problem. Uh, it would be nice if we did. And uh, and uh, for Adele, I would say you're right that that what we could do probably, if at best, would maybe cool parts of the Arctic or the of Hudson Bay for a while. And the question is, can we keep it up long enough and keep it up enough to to make the kind of difference that we want? Now, here's the point that I would like to introduce now, which is that uh, probably the cloud brightening is not going to be enough to do the job. But the, it's possible to combine the cloud brightening technology with one of the other uh, methods that uh, and Paul has mentioned, the the thinning of the cirrus clouds. That is, if, if you knock out the uh, ice in the high, high, high clouds, uh, then that will actually allow some of the Earth's heat to escape. And as I understand it, you could do that throughout the winter. You could seed the clouds, the cirrus clouds that are very high, and that would allow uh, the, some of the heat from the from the planet, and especially, of course, from the Arctic, to escape. The problem there is one of the problems, and that might even be the problem for the cloud brightening, that the uh, you could increase the amount of rainfall in another part of the world, as I understand it, the Sahel in Africa. And uh, the monsoons in India and Pakistan might become real floods. And this might, this is the reason some of the people have said, well, we could do it. We could knock out uh, some of the cirrus clouds, but it would possibly have negative effects on people elsewhere. And so they sort of said, don't do it. Uh, we don't know enough yet. So I think that uh, this is the kind of thing we could combine the two approaches, the uh, eliminating, uh, thinning the clouds, the cirrus clouds, along with the cloud brightening. Um, these, you could do both, and this would multiply the effects of cooling the Arctic. Uh, again, there are some dangers involved. Another approach that, that Paul hasn't mentioned, and maybe you, maybe, I don't know, one of you should uh, describe, which is that you could take water from underneath and spray it on top of the existing ice. As I understand it, that's how they make ice rinks, keep ice rinks cold, is they go along the top of the ice and spray it so that it thick, keeps thickening the ice. So, uh, uh, Paul, would you explain how that would work? And I know that Stephen had, uh, when I spoke to him last about that, you have some objections to doing that. So the point is there are downsides or potential dangers in all of these things. And that's what we want to think about is the problems that we're causing. Uh, Paul, explain. Yeah, what so I, uh, look, so yeah. just, I'll start off with Ottawa. The canal, this is the first year ever that the, uh, the, the Rio Canal has not frozen sufficiently thick for skating. And this, you know, skating in Ottawa has been going on for many, many years. I don't know, 50 plus years. I don't know how long the canal, when the canal was first developed as a skating rink. You know, it's 7.8 kilometers along, touted as the longest rink in the world. And um, what they do is uh, when ice thickens, of course, ice growth starts off very, very fast. The, you know, from cold air above and... Um, 
Of course, it freezes on the bottom, you know, and thickens always just on the bottom, on the bottom. So you need the heat going through the ice from the atmosphere to the bottom of the ice to chill the water enough to freeze it onto the bottom. Ice is a good insulator. So the thicker the ice grows, the slower the process occurs. So ice thickening, you know, go, goes on a curve and slows down. So if you take water from underneath the ice and pump it on top of the ice, you can greatly increase the thickening rate, at least double it, because now the ice is, now the water is freezing on the top of the ice and on the bottom of the ice. Um, so you can get much thicker growth rates or you can pump, uh, you know, slushy um, sort of water on top or, you, you know, people have tried different things to, to enhance the process. Um, and you, of course, want to get the snow off the ice because snow is also a good insulator. So if you want the ice to thicken faster and it's got a snow cover, snow layer on top, you plow all the snow off, right? So that the heat uh, doesn't have to go through the snow and ice, which are both insulators. It just goes through the ice. So, um, you know, these techniques have been used uh, for years and years uh, to um, enhance the longevity of ice roads in the far north. So I know, um, uh, you know, in I do some work with some people in Winnipeg and a lot of the First Nations um, people, communities east of Winnipeg have no, um, they have no road access during the summer, right? Lots of little islands and so on. But in the winter, if it's cold enough, they make these ice roads, which go island hopping, basically. And then transport trucks can drive goods across to the communities in the winter. So these ice roads are very important and they've been doing this for many, many years, but now it's much more harder to make these ice roads because of the warming temperatures and they don't last as long. But if you can get an ice road in operation for even three weeks or a month, it's worth your while doing it because in that time when it's open, you can get huge amounts of goods transported. And you don't, if you don't do it that way, you have to fly them in basically, or something go in by boat perhaps. But Anyway, so the technology for thickening ice has been around for a while. So some of those methods, you know, some people have envisioned, um, you know, little, little renewable energy, energy sources, say, you know, little wind turbines, running a pump, pumping water from below the ice to above the ice, et cetera. But of course, you know, the, the Arctic is vast. I mean, to do it, to, to, to think of a concept like that, um, being, you know, more effect, being eff effective to thicken the whole ice is just absurd up there. So, so we're looking at all of these different uh, technologies and ideas. Um, the National Capital Commission in Ottawa has hired uh, in a bunch of engineers at Carleton University to try to um, find ways to thicken the ice on the canal for skating and also for extending the duration of the skating season. But you know, with warming climate, it's these these things are all kind of band aids right now. I mean, the climate is warming so quickly that um, here's a couple things. Okay, um, right now the Arctic sea ice is near record lows, extent and area. Antarctica is way way below record lows. Okay, um, and we've been coming out of it. We're still in a La Nina where there's not too much heat coming out of the ocean. It's supposed to be a bit cooler than otherwise. When we, we're heading into an El Nino, and if it's a super El Nino, we're likely to blow past the 1.5 degrees Celsius target um, in, in 2024, 2025. If it's a super El Nino, such at, you know, as strong as they say the 1998 El Nino, or the 2015-2016 uh, El Nino. So those were both super El Ninos, very powerful El Ninos, lots of heat coming out of the ocean, lots of heating of the atmosphere. So the next super El Nino will blow away all temperature records on the planet. Um, and the Arctic will continue to warm even more. And uh, it will only be who knows exactly when, but we're gonna have what I call a blue ocean event in the Arctic where there's no, uh, no ice, at the end of the summer season or less than a million square kilometers is the number that lots of people use. That ice I think will be circulating, the, the, light, the ice that is left, most scientists say it'll be fast ice, it'll be along the edges of the coastlines, et cetera. I think that's complete nonsense because those regions are much lower latitude. That ice is gonna be gone 
much faster than say uh, the last ice that's circulating in the Arctic, I think will be circulating around the North pole. Um, I don't understand, you know, there's a lot of, there's too much compartmentalization in science. People are all in their own little areas. They don't have enough system thinking, but we're heading to an ice free Arctic, you know, whether it be in five years or 10 years or 15 years, you know, who knows, right. It's hard to make predictions on that, but that's where we're heading. That's where the trend is going. And once that happens, as Meta was saying, the concern is big relief. You know, the, we know all about the permafrost, the amount of carbon stored in there. When that goes into the atmosphere, um, CO2, methane, et cetera, you know, we're heading to a much warmer world where there's much less ice and snow in the Arctic. There's no sea ice um, in the summer and then it ex or, or in, say, September. And then within a few years of that, there's no, no sea ice for uh, August, September, October. And with a few more years, there's no sea ice for July, August, September, October, November. Right. And then eventually year round, I think no sea ice in the Arctic. The only ice up there will be covering Greenland. Now, the way the jet streams are, are the jet streams circle around the, 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 the center of cold, if you like, which is near the Arctic, near the North Pole right now, but offset towards Greenland, because we've got this you know, just look at the map and you've got this, where, where's the center of cold, if you like, the centroid of cold, and it's not in the North Pole, it's, it's centered towards Greenland. But imagine with no sea ice, the only snow and ice is, is on Greenland, the center of Greenland is about 73 degrees north latitude. So not only will the jet streams slow down and become wavier, causing all these extreme weather events, uh, but the jet stream will rotate over a, sl a lower latitude area. So that will offset. So the whole climate system is rewiring and changing, and it's going to affect how we grow food on the planet. It's going to affect every person on the planet. And this is where we're heading. This is what the, the, the best overall system science is. Uh, not many people are studying this, but more and more people are becoming on board. It's why I do my videos. It's what I've been doing for for years is why I have about 1500 or plus videos on on YouTube I try to educate the public as to what is happening so so we're talking about trying to preserve what we're talking about is is really you know think of it in terms of the big picture of things right so it's you okay, know thank you Paul and I think I want to we don't have much time left I, I think I would like uh, Stephen's response to all this because it, it, we've kind of uh, taken your idea and have gone every which direction uh, with it. And uh, you may, uh, at, at, what's your response to the diversity of perspectives and concerns that we've inter introduced here? Do you still feel uh, we're on target with, um, with your, your basic idea? Uh, first of all, I'd like to say something a bit about this ice thickening. Now, that will work very well if you're only wanting to thicken a one ice rink or one, one road. But you're actually putting relatively quite hot water on top of the ice, and you're going to be warming up the air above it. So you'll be thinning ice somewhere else. Okay, it, so it's it's a small area at the cost of you warming up uh, uh, slightly a much bigger area now uh, that means that it's uh, the the air above the ice that you're treating is not an infinitely large heat sink okay and if you were to work out the uh, if you're going to freeze one square meter and put that heat into one square meter of air above the where you where you uh, you, you thicken the ice the temperature of the air is going to go up to about 30 degrees Celsius mm. for a meter thickness of ice in a meter square area. It's the ratio of the uh, rate of heat of fusion of the ice and the specific heat of the air above it. And it will, you, you, you'll get really hot uh, if you concentrated all that heat into just the area of the ice that you, you've uh, produced. It's going to be very much hotter. So it's a it's a small area solution. Okay, so if, are we going to say we've kind of ruled that out? And yeah. what's left now 
uh, is a possible combination of the two methods that we've considered. Not We haven't looked deeply into the serous cloud idea, but as, as far as I know, you could combine the serous cloud thinning with the uh, summertime uh, cloud brightening of the yeah. low level clouds, right? Yeah. You, could also, you, you could also increase the uh, the the reflectivity in the in the high stratosphere, and there are people who who are designing ways of doing this from aircraft. The trouble with that is that it's got a much longer life than the uh, than the, the the cloud brightening. If you did cloud brightening in the winter, it would work in the wrong direction. The cloud brightening has a very short life, and if you if you stop doing the spraying within the the, the, the lifetime of the next snow shower, the next rain shower, it's all been forgiven and forgotten. So mm -hmm. we would we would only do it for about three months over midsummer, and then we would stop. And you can't be quite sure that the 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 uh, stratospheric sulfur idea for 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 cooling is going to stop quickly enough. Uh, it, it, some people say that you can do it quickly, but <laughs> other people think it goes there for two or three years. Okay, uh, so Stephen, the three. The three months over midsummer, the the for cloud brightening, that would only be done over open water. Is that correct? You wouldn't do it over areas, say, of Hudson's Bay that were ice covered. Uh, well, it would be much less effective. It's already a very good reflector, right? Okay. So that that's the only reason for not doing it. But so you would uh, you you would right? So you would do it over a region if it worked and the ice formed you would then move yeah. to a different region of open water and well, do it well, there and continue on is that correct uh, it, it, the effect is spread over a whole area so what would happen is where there is a border the ice will be going more towards the open sea and you can choose exactly where you do it if you know what the wind direction and the wind speed is going to be you have really quite a lot of control over which bit you want to to cool and we would be eventually we would be wanting to do it with uh, from vessels that are very mobile and can go extremely quickly if you if they're not spraying. So you could go from the North Pole to the South Pole in about three or four weeks. Uh, so so we, we we wouldn't be wanting to do it in the winter in the Arctic anyway because there's no right. no sunlight to reflect. But they would be off to Australia or uh, right. the, the, the Caribbean or whatever you want to do. It. This okay. is a very, very fast moving vessel when it's not when it's not uh, not spraying. So you you can choose where and when uh, and when to stop. Uh, I'm going to give the last word to Lawrence because uh, you actually are in a situation where you can go talk to people and consult and ask people what they want and how they feel about all this. Uh, so uh, is there anything we can do to? Um, present more information to you that might be useful? Well, I think it's this, this topic is a good starting point. The, uh, automatically, uh, the people will say, well, you know, it's one ecosystem. You can try to affect change in one section without affecting the other. So I think, you know, uh, that has, has to be kept in mind. If you're gonna go into, out talking about this, you have to have answers ready for those kinds of questions. And the thing is also uh, many of the communities I'm working with are inland. So their concern is more on the permafrost melting as opposed to the ice thinning in the Hudson Bay. If they spend more time on the land, on the rivers and so forth, and they see the impacts there. So what can be done would be the question on the permafrost melting as opposed to trying to work on the Hudson Bay ice. This is important. If you, if you manage to restore and thicken ice on Hudson's Bay and James Bay, then that will cool temperatures inland and help the permafrost. Certainly, you won't have open water on coastlines because that will start causes huge erosion, especially with high wave action and can degrade coastal permafrost. But if you have an ice layer over the, over the uh, bays, um, it's going to be much cooler inland uh, because the, the, the onshore breezes, for example, are colder. It acts more as a continental climate situation rather than a, a, a climate on a shoreline. You know, mm -hmm. and I, if, you're, if, you're, if you're next to a lake and the lake is ice covered, you don't have the warm moderating lake effect occurring as long as there's ice cover on that body of water. So, so it's a big improvement for cooler temperatures inland 
um, it's not independent of, of, of the state of the, of the ice on the base. Just so well, you know. I, I, can, I can see the other thing that people are saying, well, you, have to, yeah. you also have to stop polluting now. There's still a lot of CO2 that's going into the air yes. that's, uh, that's arriving sure. into yes. our territory. So stop right. that. Maybe you'll have a better chance of doing what we're talking about doing here. We need both. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I'm wondering if it would be interesting if, if we could get some sort of feedback from people that, you know, people that live up in that region. Like, for example, you know, show, tell, you know, send your friends and people that you know uh, this video right and other videos mm -hmm. where you know we're talking a lot about hudson's bay and what's possible because people aren't aware they wouldn't be aware that anything was possible at all i'm going to edit this and post it tonight on our website to save the world.ca and when you scroll down under the screen where you can watch that uh, there's a place that says public comments so if you click there it'll take you to a place where you can uh, comment so I want to encourage people, anybody in the world who's interested in this issue, to go there and post your thoughts and, and issues and questions. And, and you can, there's also you can re reply to each other. So we can have a real discussion continuing about what we've uh, raised today, because there are a thousand more things to be said on the subject. And, and uh, that's the place to do it. Please use it. Feel, feel free. Anybody can go there and post your thoughts or questions and um, have a have a continuing conversation about this so we're not through but uh we're through for now uh we've used up our time so i'm very very grateful to all of you and i i think and we can have i a... have one burning question for like right. one one minute sure. yeah okay well i'm wondering if there's any role for seeding the clouds from above uh and, and particularly uh there's obviously uh, planes that exist. Uh, I'm, I'm not, you know, but it, it instead of from below, from above, and then also if you could do that from above, you might save the permafrost. It's, Does anybody know? You don't need to do it from an airplane. You can do it all from from boat ships on on the on the sea because the air above the sea is very turbulent. It's a bit like putting some cream in your coffee and stirring it. So the this little salt fragments that we're getting are going to get up to where the clouds are, whether we, uh, whether, whether we, uh, whatever happens, because this, the, the air is turbulent. So it's much, much cheaper to release them at the surface than to fly. All right. So, so you yeah, don't need you're, to you're generating the, um, the cloud condensation nuclei, the little salt crystals that are engineered to be the right size to make the right proper types of clouds. The source mm -hmm. is uh, seawater, which you're pumping through nozzles. So if you're on a plane, you're talking about huge uh, weight transport. You know, you're talking about a Hercules full of water, seawater to pump it through the nozzles. Like to, you have to be, figure out how to create those little particles. Yeah. So um, that's, you know, it's, it's much cheaper and easier just to use yeah. seawater from the ocean. If you, and once it, if you pump it a few meters, you know, a few meters or tens of meters above the surface, air turbulence is going to carry it very quickly and distribute it amongst the boundary layer, which is about the bottom 1.5 kilometers above the surface. You, you get a pretty even mixture very quickly. Yeah. Um, the, 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 you have to think about the size of the fragments that we're putting up. It's a bit like having a marble being dropped in a liquid that's a hundred times thicker than syrup. Okay, so you can pretty well forget how fast the little dry fragments would fall if it, the air was still. The air is moving around randomly with velocities very often a meter per second uh, and more and more. And uh, this is a way of stirring your coffee cup. <laughs> okay, well, that's the end of our conversation for today. And okay. we will be back in about a month. So watch your timetable. I'll let you know. And we'll have a continuation of this, to me, extremely interesting and maybe important conversation. Thank you all. Bye now. Thank you. Bye-bye. Project Save the World produces these shows. This is episode 546. 
You can watch them or listen to them as audio podcasts on our website to save the world.ca. People share information there also about six global issues. To find a particular talk show, enter its title or episode number in the search bar or the name of one of the guest speakers. Project Save the World also produces a quarterly online publication, Peace Magazine. You can subscribe for $20 Canadian per year. Just go to pressreader.com on your browser and in the search bar, enter the word peace. You'll see buttons to click to subscribe.